By now, you've heard about Global Poker, one of the fastest growing online card rooms available in the US and Canada today. So what's stopping you from trying it out? Global Poker is a safe and secure social poker site that uses their own patented sweepstakes model. Signing up is easy. You can use Google, Facebook, or just an email address. You can always play for free on Global Poker, but you can also buy gold coins for additional play, which will earn sweeps coins that can be redeemed for real cash to a bank account, Skrill account, or even as a gift card. Get a free 5,000 gold coins when you sign up right now at GlobalPoker.com. Poker Stories is an audio series that features casual interviews with some of the game's best players and personalities. Each episode highlights a well-known figure in the poker world and dives deep into their favorite tales both on and off the felt. Hello and welcome to Poker Stories, a podcast brought to you by Card Player, the Poker Authority, and hosted by me, Julio Rodriguez. This is episode number 116, uh, and it's a special one because it's our first ever couples interview featuring Christy Arnett Moreno and her husband, Andrew Moreno. Uh, Now, you probably know Christy from her time working in poker media. Over the years, she has written uh, hundreds of articles and appeared in hundreds of videos doing feature stories and strategy interviews with some of the best players in the world for both Poker News and right here at Card Player. Andrew is a professional poker player and he's done a lot over the years, including final tabling, the monster stack at the WSOP, and making a couple of deep runs in the main event. But he is putting together the best stretch of his 15-year career here in 2021. In May, he final tabled an MSPT event, and then in June, he won a Venetian deep stack event for $127,000. Then just last week, he took down the inaugural Win Millions main event for a massive $1.46 million. As a result, he was named GPI Player of the Month and currently sits in fourth place in the Card Player Player of the Year race. Uh, This was a really fun one to record, and as it turns out, was also a great opportunity for me to catch up with some old friends. So, without further ado, let's listen to my conversation with Andrew and Christy. I am here with Andrew Moreno and his lovely wife, Christy Arnett Moreno. How are you guys doing? Oh, man, we're doing so good right now. We're so happy. <laughs> it's crazy good. It's yeah. so good, I'm kind of freaked out, you know? Is it? Is it almost like you're waiting for something bad to happen? Is like everything's going right? I hope I mean, not. I mean, I think that in general I'm a little more anxious about those things. Plus, I'm extra hormonal. So I think that has been going through my mind. But I think Andrew's just on... I'm just riding the wave. Yeah. <laughs> Life's good, man. <laughs> you should. A heater is a heater, and it doesn't have to stop until you say so, you know what I mean? And this has been an absolutely amazing year for you guys, which we will get into. Uh, but full disclosure to my audience, my listening audience, I've known you guys for a long time now. Uh, I'm guessing 15, 16, uh, 14, 15 years, something like that? Sounds to, right. Yeah, it's been quite What, what was your, your first World Series, Christy? 2006. Yeah, that was mine as well. So yeah, 15 years known these guys, uh, and you know some of my earliest Las Vegas friends back when we were all desperate to figure some things out and <laughs> st- struggling through the poker life. Um, but on this show, you know, we get to know you guys back from the beginning, obviously. Andrew and Christy have poker stories to tell us, but I want first to go back to the beginning and find out where they came from and how they discovered this gambling lifestyle. Uh, let's start with Christy. And, uh, Andrew as well. I mean, you're both from Indiana, or you both lived in Indiana? Well, I grew up in Michigan, but I went to college in Fort Wayne, Indiana, where that's where I met Andrew. And he was already playing poker. And our very first date, the very first night we talked, we I had I had just started playing and I was obsessed with it. And he was at a restaurant celebrating his first big win. You want to tell him about that real quick? Yeah. So I was a twenty-two. 
I was 22? Mm -hmm. Okay, see, sometimes we're, we've been together so long we have to verify each other's yeah. ages. <laughs> this is um, great. I've never had a couple on before, so the, now I know when anyone's lying, it immediately gets called out. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, big time. Um, yeah, and you were 19 at the time, too. You're just crazy. But um, So I was playing in this online tournament on Party Poker. They had these step higher tournaments, and I had worked my way all the way up to the final step. It was a $3,300 buy-in single table. And, you know, I played this crazy hand where I made this crazy bluff on this guy. To this day, probably one of the craziest hands I ever played. I re-raised the guy pre-flop. He donk bet the flop into me. I raised him with ace high. He called. He donk bet the turn again. <laughs> I raised him with ace high again. He called. And then on the river, he donk bet again. And then I went all in with ace high. <laughs> and I like to tell this hand because the guy folds and I'm going to winning the tournament. And it was around 16000 that I won for the, for the tournament. And I went out celebrating with my friends that night, and we went all the way across town to this place I never would have went to if we weren't out celebrating. And that's where Christy was working, and we were celebrating that, talking about poker, uh, because I had just won all that money. Uh, and she heard me talking about poker, and I feel like if I get called on that bluff, I don't know if I ever meet you. It's it's probably unlikely, but yeah, I heard them talking about poker, and I was like, hey guys, I play poker, I want to play too. And at the time, I honestly wasn't thinking about hooking up with some guys or whatever. I just loved poker and was looking for more places to play. And then all of a sudden, this guy turns to me and says, I'll, I'll take you to play poker. And I was like, oh, wait, he's <laughs> really cute. So our first date basically was to go play poker in these underground games in Fort Wayne, Indiana, where, you know, there's cigar smoke and porn on the tv and like <laughs> i don't know so it's crazy the yeah. establishments yeah See the establishments but yeah that was our beginning so andrew you essentially won a wife in that tournament and a child <laughs> <laughs> that's true actually i didn't think of it that way uh you know um i i asked uh how you first even heard about poker so christy you were into poker but how did that interest first get started a lot of my high school friends were getting into it, and I was actually my high school boyfriend was a... Whoa, hey, hey. who's this guy? <laughs> <laughs> so this guy taught you poker, huh? Yeah, but you taught me better. Okay, that's a, okay. I can um, that. But yeah, that guy, yeah, and have it was just like... up that guy? Has, does he have any caches in the tournament database? <laughs> oh, no, I think he quit poker a long time ago, but... Um, yeah, it was just, it was right around the moneymaker phase, or, the, you know, the moneymaker time, and people had just, in my high school, started playing, so I wanted to play, too. All right, and uh, did you just think you were good at it right away? Did you start reading books, or was it all just the gambling nature that you liked about it? I loved everything about it, and I often talk to, like, I see now how, you know, I, I've stopped playing a ton in the last couple of years, and we can talk about that later, but... Um, the game is different. Like back then, I was reading Mike's my, wait Mike Caro's book <laughs> of tells. Yeah, and that was how you got good at poker. It was like, you know, what are they doing with their hands and reading and psychology and like that kind some of, of stuff. Some of that stuff still works. I'm telling you, it, some <laughs> of it still works. I will not, I will never dis, uh, discount my own live reads. It's too much fun. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. I agree. But uh, but that's what I loved. I loved the competitive nature of it. And I liked winning money. And I definitely was better than most of my friends in the beginning. And I think whenever you have a little seed of like you could be good at something, it makes you like it more. I think that at least that was true for me. And Andrew? Um, yeah, I was just... Um... What was the question? I'm <laughs> sorry, you, I was listening to What got to you into story. poker? <laughs> like the very first. Okay. Oh, yeah. So, you know, the way I got started in poker, actually. You do uh, have an older brother who also plays poker. So I think a lot of people may assume he got you into it. Yeah, actually, I was, uh, I got into, I got my brother into poker. So I remember when I won that tournament, I walked into his room and I said, I said, Johnny, I just won sixteen thousand dollars in an online poker game and he was on the phone with someone and he said 
my brother just spent $16,000. I'm going to have to call you back. <laughs> and he's like, tell me about this game that you're playing. Um, yeah, so I, I actually did get started a couple years ahead of him. But, you know, the thing about poker that so fascinated me so much was that I was at a friend's house. And we used to go over there and just, like, have drinks and just, like, I don't know. I don't even know what we did. We were just young and sit around and watch TV or whatever. And they were playing poker one day. And I remember... A friend of mine was playing, and then I was just watching the game, and then he'd be like, I think you have pocket queens or something. And then the guy would, like, he would fold, and the guy would show, like, pocket queens or two queens. And I was like, I was like, okay, this is, like, a magic game. Hard game. <laughs> this guy knows how to, like, this is, like, you know, he's, like, a magician or something. And so then I was watching him, and he could continually kind of know what people had, and I was like, how is this even possible? So it was that idea that somebody could know or have an idea of what was held in your hand without seeing your cards, it intrigued me so much that I just had to learn how this was a thing, and, and, and that really set me off on my journey. And after the two of you meet in college, uh, was it all poker all the time? Did you guys encourage each other in that way? I'd say so. I mean, we were both kind of obsessed at that point. I was in college, and I remember... Uh, I didn't quite make it through because I was <laughs> I was a little too invested in the poker thing. But I know Christy and I both like it was just it was our it was our world. Yeah, we always had a place to play. There was, you know, Monday was like AJ's and Tuesdays was Peanuts and there was all these bar games and underground games. So it was actually pretty crazy time in Fort Wayne poker. Um and we would I would go to class and then we would go out and play and and you had soccer at the time too. I did so. have soccer. I'm saying, how did you, how did you manage being on a university team at the same time as all this? Well, not well. My coaches, <laughs> I was, I was on scholarship, and uh, my coaches sat me down, and they were like, "You can't do this anymore." Like, because I was really <laughs> struggling. I also during the time didn't understand nutrition or. Uh, you know, sleep and those kinds of things that would help you be an athlete because I was like drinking and eating wings all day. And then I was really struggling on the field and not sleeping and playing poker. But <laughs> yeah, so not well, but we got, I don't know, we got through. We did. <laughs> so tell me how you guys get to Las Vegas. Oh, I can tell this part. So basically... Christy and I have been together for, I don't know, six months, maybe a year. We were pretty early on. How long? So somewhere in that yeah, ballpark. A about a year. And I really liked her. Um, and I think she liked me a decent amount at that time. And she was like, look, she came to me one day and she said, I'm going to Vegas and um, you can come if you want. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> so like you're breaking up with me if I don't come. <laughs> and she's like, yeah, it's over if you don't come. I was like, ah, I, could, I could go to Vegas. Yeah, I like Vegas. Like, we could go try poker out there. So, um, and actually, at the time, like, I was, you know, from small town Indiana, and I really just didn't know much about the world. And I would never have gone. I never really thought about, you know, leaving my little bubble. And then I had, uh, I had one chance to, to, to leave. And I was like, you know what? I'm following this girl. I need to see where this thing takes me. What's funny is that, like, I don't think. I don't I don't know what I was thinking when I said that because really deep down I don't know if I really would have left without you maybe but I don't know maybe it was maybe it was just a level I don't know but it's but it's interesting I did say that I, <laughs> it was a bluff she yeah got it through. you got it through <laughs> <laughs> I got that one through but I also thought like why wouldn't he want to come you know uh, yeah, I just wonder, you know, how was the games back then? How, was your bankroll progressing to the point where you thought, I'm ready for Vegas? Or was it a little premature? And also, Christy, what was the reason for you going to Vegas in the first place? Well, I... Well, okay, so Andrew took me to Vegas for the first time when I, we had just met. We went on New Year's. I was still 19, but I had a fake ID. We took a Greyhound bus. We took a Greyhound bus. Holy <laughs> shit. Two, for two straight days to get to Vegas because we couldn't afford uh, flights. But but I fell in love with Vegas. And we had some really sweet experiences at the Sahara Poker Tournament. Oh, and I I, thought, yeah. We became friends with a lot of the dealers. Yeah. And 
That was you talk really about the late the late night tournament they used to run. Yeah, yeah. the sixty dollar one. Yeah. Um, and I just thought we could make it there, and I knew, always knew I wanted to leave the Midwest, and so I had this opportunity to uh, basically finish school at UNLV through this transfer program. So I, I wanted to take it, but what I think is really interesting about our story in terms of us actually going to Vegas was that the four win games were amazing. Andrew and I, we both made money just traveling around the circuit, but right before we left go to Vegas, there were a series of events that set us back. One, I had ovarian cancer tumor removed. I had surgery that set us back some money. And then you want to tell yeah, them about well, Dave and <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, I was running an underground poker game, and uh, my business partner basically all of our money. <laughs> and then I had my nose broken in a basketball game. And poker players don't have insurance. Yeah, and so then we basically moved to Vegas with, like, pretty much no money. I got a broken nose. You're recovering from, you know, your ovarian cancer. It was, It was a very strange trying time in our lives like we definitely were uh struggling financially and um you know you got the job at card player which that was huge i mean that was like an, enough for us to be able to you know me to like do okay at one two and then you could pay the bills and provide the food and yeah. you know while you were mixing in time playing yourself mm-hmm I mean, talk about a test early on in a relationship. What can what were those early years like? And also, how great was your friend Julio at the time? <laughs> <laughs> well, he's always had a good sense of humor. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, no, it was. Uh, I would say, like, you know, if you're in this industry for any period of time, like as a poker player, you've gone broke, and if you haven't gone broke. I don't really know, like, if you have the kind of uh, experience that you need to handle real adversity, because going broke is the thing in poker that's like, that will humble you, it'll bring you to your knees, and it will make you question everything. And I had that happen more than a few times, especially early in my career, and Christy and I, we were just babies, you know, and we, we would have these big explosive fights, and you know, one thing I'm so grateful for is just those experiences, being broke, learning so much about myself in those trying moments and those trying times because I was kind of a shit human when I was down and out. And, like, I never really realized it until it kind of would come out in these little tantrums I would have. And then I realized, like, poker really allowed me to see a lot of my blind spots and really work on them. And... Mm. Um, you know, I'm so grateful for that because just the fact that I have the relationship that I do today, if poker's brought me one thing, it's definitely that. Yeah. Yeah, those... So, for, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, you you go ahead. <laughs> I was just going to say, like, the, this is interesting to for us even to talk about because it's been a while since we've thought about those things. But when, yeah, I had the... T- job at car player and meeting this amazing friend Julio but really like at the beginning it was really hard for us because we didn't have any friends we didn't have any family and it took us a few months to actually make friends with you guys and you know other people I think Julio or I think Sean I don't know there's a there's a card player crew that we used to go to lunch every day together and it became a real family and we really hadn't had that in the first few months which was so hard um but then also to to talk about what andrew was saying it's like i forgot that he would have these like because he's so great now like when he loses he's like it's unbelievable he's like a zen buddha wise tree frog guy you know (laughs) like he talks about his lessons and he's just so great but Back in the day when we were like 20, 22, 
I remember one time he used to, because we used to be uh, Planet Hollywood regs, where we would play the one two there. I remember <laughs> and until they had their scandal. Would, <laughs> Andrew would somehow get into the game for like fifteen hundred dollars, <laughs> and it was, <laughs> when we had no money. But we had like eleven hundred dollars. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the credit card was in play. Yeah, and he'd be playing for like eighteen hours or something, and then and one time I was playing like like this forty dollar. Planet Hollywood tournament, and I like was all happy. I like won four hundred bucks or something. <laughs> she walked over to the table, and I was stuck all this money. And she like she showed me how much money she won, and I, I had just, the chips in my hand. I just grabbed it out of her hand and I put it on the table, <laughs> <laughs> and then I dusted it off like ten minutes later. <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> those early Vegas degen days for sure, when it's just like. <laughs> All you're praying for is a is just just give me ten winning sessions in a row, God. Just ten in a row, and I won't beg for anything else. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I mean, I remember there your ups and downs during that time. Um, was there a time? I mean, where you just considered doing something else? Yeah. So for me, I actually right around that time, I got a job working for uh, this company, Spade Club, which was owned by card player and they were an online poker site and I would answer customer support emails uh, people had questions or problems with the software and they would email in and honestly that was very humbling but also just kind of bizarre to see the mind of people that like you know think that poker's rigged and the things that they would the things <laughs> yeah. that human beings can say to other human beings is like it's just it's mind blowing. Um, so yeah, I did that for a good six months, and you know, I was a part of that card player crew that was going to lunches and stuff, and I felt like really connected in that way. But I, I also felt like that taking that that step back for a couple months and looking at like, you know, a life outside of being a professional poker player, uh, as and contrasting that with the life that I, I had pr- prior, I realized that I wanted to really like dive into poker and take it more seriously than I had. So, um, yeah, that was, uh, that was definitely a really interesting time. And Christy, obviously you had a unique position in the poker world because at the same time, while you're trying to play and get better and obviously build a bankroll, you're also working in poker media first at card player. And then with poker news, uh, what was that like? I mean, it, it, you, we're in a unique position with our jobs, given that we have access to all these brilliant poker minds. Uh, but at the same time, at that point in our lives, we're still grinding the one-two games, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, You know, looking back, I wish I would have taken way more advantage of, of you know, the kinds of people who were willing to help. And I, I think I did, you know, because whenever I asked did strategy articles, I was actually asking the questions that I wanted to know. But at the same time, I don't know. I just, it was, it was great. I never thought that, because mostly I saw what Andrew went through. He, the pressure of playing for a living just looked so hard that I, ne- I felt like I never wanted to do that until, um, until I had other ambitions outside of poker reporting that I knew playing poker for a living would allow me the freedom to pursue those things. Um, but man, I mean, working at card player and poker news, this is the best, it was the, the best job ever for a long time. <laughs> Traveling and getting to play and watching a game that you love. Favorite poker better. trip. Uh, favorite poker trip from uh, all, all of our time covering the circuit. Hmm. Or favorite destination? I really like, I, personally, I, I really liked Barcelona and the PCA, uh, especially like the first few times. The first few times of the PCA were my yeah. fate. <laughs> were my... You, you can get burnt out on the lazy river and the shark slide, I guess. <laughs> yeah, but then, yeah, PCA number like seven or eight was like, oh, man, okay. <laughs> but the first ones were like, this is incredible. The Bahamas and, in January. <laughs> exactly, oh, yeah. and us, we, we would drink, what were they called? Oh, the ba- Bahama Mamas? Uh, oh, the you're talking called? about the beer? Oh, it's um, 
Oh, what is this? It was in a red can, right? Um, I forget. Oh, uh, man. Too. People are screaming it in their car right now. I know, <laughs> they are. <laughs> the Bahamian beer known as... Oh, uh, Kalik. 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 Yeah, Kalik. Yeah, just yeah. came yes. to me. Yeah, wow, we, that was we, good, man. I always... If I could if I could take any of the money that I just won in this tournament and put it on Julio in some <laughs> like Jeopardy or you know, Wheel Trivia. of Fortune or something where he has to like critically think and use his brain to figure something out, I would I would definitely do that. <laughs> I'm I'm the guy who plays Jeopardy and I'll run a category and then completely blank the next one. So I'm <laughs> I'm no Ken Jennings, I'm no uh James Holzhauer, that's for sure. Uh uh-huh. all right, so Let's talk about tournament scores, because those are fun. We'll start with the all-star of the group. Christy, um, you final tabled a big circuit main event at the bike a couple years ago. Can you tell me what that experience was like? So earlier that year, I decided that I wanted to play a bunch of World Series of Poker tournaments that summer. I wanted to go do the thing, play, you know, every, every other day or a bunch of events. And so I decided to take my tournament game and study and I started like studying raise your edge and so then I was looking at tournaments leading up to the WSOP and that circuit event was one of them we were living in San Diego at the time and it's funny because I we had a couple friends uh at our house and I was like hey guys just so you know, I know you're still going to be here on Sunday, but I'm going to go to L.A. and I'm going to go play this poker tournament. <laughs> and everybody was like, oh, okay, uh, okay. And because I, I, I was just set and I, I just wanted to do it. And so we went to L.A. and I final tabled. And even like Andrew and I have talked about this now, every time that either of us feel like I ha- for some reason I have to go play this event, we've done well. And that's kind of been his. I mean, he's going to talk about his tournaments, too, in a second, but his trajectory, too, like, as soon as he decided or as soon as, you know, I decided I wanted to to take tournaments seriously, I think that just a a really high level of focus and belief in yourself and purpose goes a long way, but, yeah, that was definitely my biggest tournament score, and um, it didn't progress into any big scores that summer, but still a nice one. And and what what did you get out of, uh, a sense of from your playing career, <laughs> as far as just focusing strictly on that? Um. Well, I think that whenever I focus on something, it I mean it always turns out better. And I think one of the things that really was a detriment to my poker game was that that summer I decided to do a vlog, and report on my YouTube channel with like these big goals and I think that it was a huge distraction and a ton of added pressure to perform plus you know hours of editing and recording that yeah. totally That's media Christy. <laughs> yeah, for sure, for sure. And and I think that poker is one of those games that requires your whole self. I mean I feel rusty if I don't play for, like, a few days. Um, and so that's why, yeah, I know Andrew's going to talk about it a little bit, but he's, he, he, even even sometimes he's like, uh, hold on, I got to, like, I got to, like, put my poker brain away, you know? And so, um, yeah, that's, that's kind of, I, I think I'm always trying to do too many things at once, and I don't know if I really ever want to just strictly be a poker player which I know will inhibit my ability to be like the greatest or the greatest I could be but that's just how I feel about it yeah and Andrew and I know Andrew you played cash for a long time uh we would play together in these weekly tournament home games that we used I miss to have those. Yeah. those were the best right just $30 buy-in people everyone splitting two tables in a living room um those are so much fun uh but based on my experience playing with you i always thought of you as a very annoying tournament player to play against. <laughs> like honestly people would say you know how does andrew play i'd be like he's annoying like he's the he's like a pest like he, he doesn't let you win a pot he he'll fight for every single chip 
you can't get any rays through. It's super annoying. <laughs> Don't have them on your left. And, you know, I was uh, wondering if, if your new and improved tournament game is, is much the same way. Yeah, I think what I would describe my kind of quote-unquote new and improved tournament game is more of a refined thought process when it comes to approaching um, poker from a theoretical standpoint against good players, uh, making sure that I'm playing more in line with kind of like, I guess, the GTO way that you should. But I'm still very much, you know, the Daniel Negreanu, Phil Ivey type where I I just rely a lot on my experience and like what what do I think this player is doing in this moment right now. And that's kind of my bread and butter. But I feel like my biggest leaks have always been around tough players that are playing uh, really correctly in a lot of spots. And now I just play a lot more in line in, in a lot of the spots against those players. But I'm still really out out of line against, uh, yeah, I mean, in this tournament in particular. Against the Julios of the world? <laughs> well, against most of the people, honestly. Dude, I, I The tournament that I just played, like, without, I mean, I don't know. I don't want to say too much about how I was playing specifically, but I did some wild shit, man. And I got away <laughs> with so many, like, crazy things it was like the hands were insane like the hands that i played were just completely bananas so i'm definitely still very much that player all right well the tournament you're referencing uh, so people can follow along is of course the ten thousand dollar buy-in win millions uh main event which you won after a deal for 1.46 million dollars which is absolutely incredible and and mind blowing, and I want to talk about that. But first, let's talk about the close calls because when I saw this result happen, I went, you know, it's about damn time because I've <laughs> I've been feeling for years like you were about to break through. You were always right there, you know. Uh, I think 2012, 2013 is when you started to put some results together, and it felt like it was going to happen. Can you talk about that? Yeah, so um, over the course of the last, I'd say, when I started to play tournaments at all, I think it was like around 2012, and then between then and around 2017, those five years, I did have some pretty close calls. I, I made uh, the final table of the Monster Stack. I made the final table of the Win Classic. Um, you know, the the Monster Stack first place was about 1.2 million. The the Win Classic first place was around six or seven hundred thousand, and uh, the main event, I made the final four tables of the main event. Uh, and, you know, obviously first place is like 10 million in that thing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, I had a moment at the final table, this win, cla- uh, the win millions, where I had, we're nine handed. I, I have 13 big blinds. I'm the shortest stack. And I looked down at pocket sevens under the gun. And I had this same scenario happen at the Win Classic main event where I went all in under the gun with sevens. I think it was eight-handed. And I got called by eights and I busted. Um, and, and after my analysis and learning more about tournaments, I realized that that sevens was a fold uh, in the Win Classic, the one I busted. And so I'm looking down at sevens here, knowing that it's really close, that I was gonna already shoving eights. And remembering how I, I busted with sevens as I'm folding my sevens here. So I feel like, to answer your question, you know, a lot of those, like, little, seemingly little things, you know, like jamming eights instead of sevens here, um, you know, that was the difference of the Win Classic to bust me an eighth rather than potentially fourth or fifth or maybe, you know, getting chips right. together and going on and winning. So I had a lot of leaks in my thought process and, and my knowledge of the game. So... I think over quarantine, doing a lot of the study that I've done, I really plugged a lot of those kind of quote unquote close spots. Uh, and I think that, I mean, clearly, like that was the difference, I think, for me at the, the, the win millions final table. I want to ask you both about sleeping on a final table, uh, both from the player perspective and from somebody watching it, because there's been a few times now where the next, you be, you're going to bed basically, and the next day you're playing for seven figures give or take. Um, how does that affect your mindset? Is it hard not to start spending the money mentally? <laughs> uh, is it all about laddering up? Uh, what, you know, because you could have easily gone into this win millions final table, finished eighth, and been very proud of yourself for a great score. Uh, but also, I'm sure, bittersweet disappointment at what could have been. 
Yeah, I think I think that there are kind of like I hate to say this, but I'm gonna say it anyway. There are like two types of poker players. Um, you know, there's the type of poker player which most recreational players and a lot of professionals fall under, which is the type that like really think about the money and the result. And there's the type that only think about the strategy and like how that changes and, and really nothing else. And I think the biggest transition I've made in the last few years is that I am only the player that thinks about the game and the strategy and not the money or the result. And sure, afterwards, like, you know, I'm going to feel the result of whatever happens, but I'm not thinking about it in the moment of the game. And at the final table, preparing for the final table, going into that, I didn't think about the money at all. I, I did, really didn't. All I thought about was, like, my chip stack, what the other chip stacks were at the table, and how that was going to dictate my strategy and where they were positioned on the table. And I think, you know, that's good for anyone listening to this, I think, because, you know, most people do fall, like, victim to thinking too much about, oh, man, like, if I call this bet here... Uh, and the guy has a flush, I'm going to be stuck two buy-ins now. And then, like, I don't know if I want to be stuck two buy-ins. Or, you know, I'm going to feel this way if I call and this guy shows me the nuts and everyone's going to be like, obviously he had it. You know, all these other, like, things, like, they're just, they're so prevalent and people, and, and even my thought process, they, they, they do pop up. Um, and then when you shift your mind to what you think the best play is and, like, you really focus only on that, and you're always focused on that, and you start playing poker as a strategy game and not as a game where you're trying to win money, like, just like, yeah, trying to win money, then I think you really open yourself up to be a much better player. Yeah. yeah. Someone pick someone pick that phone up off the table. Yeah. <laughs> it's vibrating. Um, oh. uh, Christy, well, how, what's it like for you watching him <laughs> go for these life-changing sums of money? So I think we both have this mindset, and I mean, growing up with the Tiger Mom, I was not this way for most of my life. I was very results oriented, very like if you if you ain't first, you're last, like very much like that. <laughs> Ricky Bobby, <laughs> huh? yeah, for sure. Um, but the last few years, that's something that we both worked on. I mean, in in my career as a content creator, trying to like get views or whatever. It's not about views; it's about the process. And I think that the night before his final table, especially, we were, you know, it's it's also my job to remind him like he is. No matter what happens the next day, it's still just part of your path. If you get eighth, if you win. It's just part of the path that you've chosen now to focus on tournaments. Christy's being nice right now. Basically, when I made the final <laughs> table, I was very frustrated because I folded the entire day. <laughs> and I basically folded myself down to a bottom chip stack. And we went to dinner and I was, I was really frustrated. And she did such an amazing job of just like saying all the things that she's saying now and like really keeping me in like a good headspace where I was like just going to approach the next day as a new day. And I got great sleep that night. And you, you really were a, a, a big part of me, like being able to have a clear head going into that final day. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I mean, I do take credit for that because honestly, Julio, like <laughs> when he, after, after he made the final table, you should have seen him. He could bear like, I think he was just in still killer mode, which, um, you know, is, is good when you're. But when you're in the zone playing poker and you have to analyze what you've done well, what you need to change, and the changing strategy at every point. If you've done that for five days straight, it's hard to transition to relax to be able to, um, you know, come into the next day not bringing in the whole past tournament or the day before so so yeah so you know I felt like my job was to remind him that he he could that it didn't matter his his chip position you just where you are where you are and now how do you proceed after that and that no matter where you finish it's just part of the path and I that I did I feel like I really didn't think about the money either Julio until like, like every page jump was like, whatever, I'm just like, I'm just there. And, and honestly, 
the thing is that I love him so much. I know how much, you know, poker means to him and all of these things. What All I really wanted the whole time was that he play in a way that he was proud of and make the decisions he felt like he should based on his gut, based on what he, you know, analyzed in his mind rather than because he was afraid. I just wanted him to feel proud of how he played. That's all I was thinking about until they got (laughs) three-handed and they were talking about the deal. And all I could see from the outside was that they were negotiating. And that is when I started thinking about the money because, I mean, you know, that's, they're not playing anymore. They're just talking about maybe locking up a million dollars. Dude, I, oh my gosh, I I felt like I had to throw up. I was like, am I going to go into labor right now? Like what is happening? (laughs) Um, and because at one point, at one point, the I heard, I overheard the chip leader, Clayton or whatever, yeah. I heard him say, let's just play. And then I was thinking, oh, my God, he's going to play for a pay jump of, like, it's a 1.2 1. 2 million, million dollars, dollars. Jumped from third to first. <laughs> so I was just freaking out. I was like, get this deal done. And then, and then you, sh- and then, then, oh, yeah, that it was, was a, it was an intense, for sure. And what does it feel like to be millionaires? Oh, man, honestly, the money thing is, like, I haven't thought much about it. I don't know. Like, I'm, I'm, uh, it's a weird thing. I don't know. Like, I guess it's, uh, I'm sure I will. And I'm sure that there'll be a time where, like, um, we'll discuss it a little bit more. But, yeah, I haven't really thought about it. (laughs) I mean, nothing really changes. I mean, the day after we didn't have toothpaste and... (laughs) <laughs> we were going to buy toothpaste in the gift shop, but Andrew was like, I don't want to pay like $8 in the gift shop. <laughs> so we went up and we d- called concierge, but then he gave the guy who brought us the toothpaste like $8 anyway. So it was like not any <laughs> any different, but but like things like that, I think. At least yeah. Walgreens didn't win, you know. That's the <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Down the man. Yeah, but. <laughs> I don't know. I don't think we're frivolous people. I don't think we're people who like, you know, I'm not like I need a Gucci bag. But what I think is amazing is that, you know, however much time he wants to take off and however much time I want to spend at home with the baby, it's going to be okay. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) that's got that's going to be the most, you know, freeing feeling ever. Uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm I'm assuming you're not going to go take 100K and jump into some high rollers, Andrew, but uh, where do your ambitions lie, you know, moving forward? You are third currently in our card player, player of the year race, because I even forgot to mention this, you know, a couple weeks before your win at the Win Millions, you took down an event at the Venetian for 125 grand. So, you know, things things are obviously going in the right direction for you. How long do you want to stay on this ride? Yeah, I'm going to be playing up until our son is born, and then uh, the World Series is going to be upon us, and we're going to have, I'm going to play through the series with uh, Christy being there with our son, and then after that, I'll be I'll be done for a while. But yeah, I, I'm not going to play any high rollers, but I do see myself potentially jumping in there sometime in the next few years once I feel like I've done a bit more work. Um, I'm excited to, to uh, push myself, but for now, it's you know, we got baby on the mind, and um, hmm. I'll probably take it a little easy. Uh, we have some rapid-fire questions to close it out, if you guys are ready. Let's do sure. it. Okay, for both of you, uh, biggest close call, one that really stings, keeps you up at night. Could be cash game, tournament-related, whatever. Just a, a what-if moment in poker. Hmm. Um, I mean... I don't know. I guess my most recent one was just the Aussie Millions final table that I had. When Andrew was talking about those close calls and not having done the study, there was a hand I shoved King 4 off, and it's definitely not in the realm of hands that I should be (laughs) shoving, and I end up getting called by Ace King and going out, and that was kind of close. So it was probably one of the bigger tables that I've gotten to play, and knowing that had I just studied more, known some more things, feels not great. Yeah, and then mine would just be the WSOP main event in 2015 where I finished 28th and I felt uh, unprepared. And to be fair, like I had Fedor on my right and Joe McKeon on my left all day. 
so they're going to make you feel unprepared even when you are prepared. But <laughs> um, yeah, I would say that definitely feels like my close call. <laughs> yeah, do you think about certain hands from that still, or are you pretty good about shrugging things off? Um, yeah, there's a few that I can remember. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, let's see here. Um, biggest pot you've ever won or lost? Your choice. Um, yeah, so my the biggest pot I ever won was in a 10 or 10 25 50 game where uh, they were playing this game where only the button could win this little ante, so oh, and it cool. would increase huh. progressively. And it got to about like I think it was a hundred dollars on the button, and then there was like around eighteen hundred on the button, and then I got pocket jacks, and I won like a maybe a six fifty sixty thousand dollar pot or something uh, on a scary board, and that was like a very big hand for me. I don't know. That was like a pretty scary one, but yeah. Damn. <laughs> Damn. Was that. this a casino game or was this a private? This was game? at uh, Ocean's Eleven. And they had like a uh, a nice little card room out in Southern California. And uh, and Christy, what about you? Anything that scary? <laughs> uh, no, I mean. There's been some big ones that I've won and lost around the same amount that I can't really remember. But the most memorable one was, I think it was right after I quit my job at Poker News, or I was about to, and I was coming out as a quote-unquote professional player, and I got invited to play on the premiere episode of Poker Night in America, where Mm -hmm. they flew me out, and I got to ride on a private plane with all of these players who I had interviewed over the years. I remember And I was now their... What? I I remember this. It was, yeah. it was a big deal, yeah. Yeah, I was now considered their peer. It was Phil Locke, you know, Greg FBT Mueller, Mike Matisau, and I was going to be playing a game 10 times bigger than my normal game, which was 2-5 at the time. I was playing some 5-10, but mostly 2-5, and we're playing 25-50, and I buy in for 5K. I get my hair and makeup done, lights, camera, action, and the the third hand, (laughs) the third shuffle, uh, I, it folds to me in the big blind, and Mike Mattis, I was in the straddle, because now we're playing 25, 50, 100, and we get all in, and I have queens, and he has ace king, and I'm just thinking, like, what just happened? Um, Obviously, I lose the race, and I'm just like, it was just such a build up then total devastation and i'm just like reaching into my purse for a second buy-in and you're like be cool don't be, be cool. cool i'm on camera be cool yeah I'm be cool. cool be cool like act like you've been here before even though you haven't and yeah <laughs> especially against mike who you've worked with for years you know like yes it's gotta be weird <laughs> oh and then and then he had chirp and chips so i had to hear him talk about how good he is at poker for like the next like hour because he was up a bunch but i ended up crawling back and making a tiny profit which was nice but still very memorable man i still remember when mike madison would come into the office the card player offices because he would always be screaming down the hallways screaming uh, he, used, he used to have to do his uh, his call-in show back there uh, back then at our studio um all right best swap or piece you've ever had of anybody this could be for anybody well, definitely, it would have been. Uh, I had a piece of this guy, Max Steinberg, uh, when we were in the main event. So uh, he ended up finishing, I think, third place or fourth, fourth place, fourth place, or fifth. No, no, I think he got fourth. Fourth, maybe, yeah. Um, which was, uh, I think, a he lot cashed of money. Close, <laughs> close to three million dollars. Yeah, so that was not not my port. That's what he cashed for. But um, we had a nice little uh, piece there. What was your worst job before poker? Uh, Taco Bell. Oh, really? Out of all of them? Yeah, I hated it. But you liked Taco Bell at the time, didn't you? I didn't. I don't think so. I didn't <laughs> like my Taco Bell job, babe. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> just because like you like the food. Jobs. Just because the that? food is tasty doesn't mean you like working there. Yeah, it was. Uh, it was like not a pleasant experience. Uh, well, what did you? What was your responsibility? Did you have to like clean the fryer or something? I mean, it was more just like. I made tacos and burritos, but it was it was gross. Like this, <laughs> when you see like back end of a lot of that stuff, I was like, okay, I don't like I don't like eating here anymore. <laughs> When's the last time you ate Taco Bell? 
Probably when I quit, honestly. <laughs> and I was like 16. So. <laughs> and Christy? Um, uh, worst job was, I, I used to corn detassel. is a thing you can do in the Midwest where you ride these machines and you pull the tassels out of corn. But it's so, the, the corn gives you rashes, so you have to wear long sleeves and long pants in the middle of summer and get paid oh. like $4 an hour. Wait, so you're just pulling the little hairs out of the corn? The yeah, the middle uh, in the middle of the stock, you got a sugar can in it, and you got to yank it out. <laughs> That's one of the more unique ones we've heard on. The <laughs> <laughs> Do you guys uh, just quick side note? I was just thinking back to some of our old drinking games. Do you guys remember two in the bowl, one in the hole? Uh, I don't. It was recall it with quarters. Name. No, we used to pour the beer into a bowl. Oh yeah, and then we would put our fingers on the on the rim. Yeah, you remember this game? I, I remember. I remember pouring all the the beer into the bowl. And I actually something. think yeah. I have a video of us playing with that. But I can't I remember exactly a... how it goes, but I think we were at like Zach's or something. I, I yeah, it was Zach's or Ryan and Amir's at the time or something like that. <laughs> Back when we used to do power hours. Oh, and... we played all the drinking games. Oh man. I, mean, I just like to think about these things when I remember that, you know, you're about to be parents and I have a seven-year-old. It's nice to <laughs> remember, remember what we used to do. Blondies? Yes. Flip, I mean, uh, beer pong games. Yeah. For sure. Planet Hollywood. There's all yeah. these, these great stories. I remember hearing a story about you at the PCA of one time. I don't know. <laughs> oh, my God. I don't know if I ever told that story on the podcast. What did you? What did you? Well, I just remember hearing. Uh, let's hear your version. I don't know. <laughs> well, all I know is, like, uh, we were out drinking one night, uh, as we did, and we were having a great old time. And in the morning, we woke up, and I, I heard that Julio had, like, a bloody nose or something. And he, like, woke up <laughs> and he was like, completely nude <laughs> like by himself yeah i woke up in my room no one was with me i was by myself hopefully but i was like half on the bed half off pants down around my ankles and bloody nose but <laughs> didn't was seem like there was any structural frogs? damage oh my god i even i forgot we'd even gone to senior frogs but i but yeah and now that makes sense for sure <laughs> the one you have to get to cross the bridge to get there yes. yeah yeah that makes sense <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you wanted to tell it or not, but that was a, that was definitely one that I I won't forget. This man is a father. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. That's what you have to keep reminding yourself. Uh, all right, let's get back on track here. Um, okay, do either of you have a celebrity doppelganger? Or growing up, did people tell you that you look like somebody? I mean, come on, I'm Asian, so everybody's always like Christy Amaguchi or the Black Widow. Or now, these days, everybody's like, Maria Ho, can I have your autograph? And I'm like, mm, not Maria Ho. That one's tough because you are in a poker room when that happens to you. Exactly. It's not like you're being stopped on the street and people going, Christy Yamaguchi, which is just racist. That's just <laughs> racist. That's we got to have a foul, too. I mean, you know. <laughs> what about you, Andrew? Anybody ever give you a look? You've had a lot of different hairstyles in the day, so. Dude, I'm always changing my appearance. You'd think I'm in the witness protection program, but. Um, no, there was this guy from this movie, Crazy Beautiful, that people used to say I look like um, when Jay I was younger. Hernandez? Jay Hernandez. That's the only one I ever heard. Yeah, when you had a shaved head. Yeah. Jay Hernandez. I, get told, I saw that movie uh, back in high school. That was a. I don't remember anything about that movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me neither. me neither. I remember there was a white girl and the Hispanic yeah, guy, and they were the, dating. That was it. And uh, the parents didn't like him, that kind of deal. Yeah. Anyway. Very typical. <laughs> uh, what are you interested in that most people aren't? So, weird hobby time. Um... I would say for me, I, I mean, I love like classical music. Um, I don't think a lot of people are really into it. Um, I think we're both kind of into pretty into Stoic philosophy, which is like kind of a weird thing to be into. Yeah. I mean, it's less weird now because you know there's mainstream people who are like Tim Ferriss and stuff, but we I, we like to 
Well, I like to read the books, and then I like to tell Andrew what the book said. And, yeah. then, and, and then, then I like to pretend like I read the book <laughs> to other people. <laughs> That's interesting. We just had somebody on the show who was talking about a book on Stoicism. And was it Martin Jacobson? Oh, it's coming out. It's coming out after this. Never mind. <laughs> oh. Yeah, it's, well, Le- it's Lex Veldhaus. Spoiler for those uh, uh, waiting for the next episode. Oh, well, actually, what's, well, one of the books... Andrew did read this book, so it's okay, but um, that I think has changed the trajectory, at least in my career, my ability to, like, do this, like, process-oriented way of life is Ego is the Enemy um, by Ryan Holiday, and it's just such a great book, I think, also for poker players. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, Uh, Ego is the Enemy is... It sounds like it was written for poker players. <laughs> yeah, you guys mentioned um, earlier that you got these feelings sometimes about going to tournaments. Um, are you superstitious at all? I'm not. No, not at all. Not even no. a little bit. You don't stack your chips in a certain way. No, no, I'm not. No. Yeah. No. Yeah, I don't think either of us have really ever. I I believe in the power of routines and stuff, but I'm not like. Well, actually, I thought that I was going to win the tournament because I had Baby Run Good on my side. Is that kind <laughs> of superstition? <laughs> Baby Run Good is a real thing, but I also know that you, before this tournament, had spoken it almost into existence. You said, "My goal this year is to have my first seven-figure score," and it happened. Do you believe in like that? The secret, or you know, saying your truth, and it'll come. It'll be reveal itself, or I don't know how they phrase it. I think for me, like when I said that, that I really wanted to put it out into the universe that like this is a goal of mine, and I wanted to hold myself accountable for moving toward it because this is a scary thing. Because basically, in order to have a seven figure score, you gotta you gotta play a really big buy in or a really big field or both, and they don't come up often, and they're usually really tough. So. It's really easy to not register those tournaments. Uh, so I wanted to say, I'm going for this, and I wanted to really start playing in, in tournaments where I could achieve that. So um, obviously didn't expect it to happen so soon, but pretty stoked that it did. <laughs> uh, what's the most entertaining thing you watched during quarantine? Well, we watched The Office from season one, episode one, all the way to the finale, <laughs> and I loved every second every of it. Every freaking second of it. I, that, to me, is the best show of all time, and it's not even close. <laughs> and I, That was like the third time I've seen every episode all the way through, and I'm like, well, when can we, when can we do this again? Maybe we'll do it next year. I don't know. <laughs> like, Make it a yearly thing. We just, we're obsessed with that show. I also think there's something so wonderfully comforting during this time that was so crazy and so scary that we could go and just lay on the couch and forget about it and for a few hours <laughs> and and just laugh so the contrast of the world ending and being able to watch the office felt extra special also yeah you know you've watched the office enough times when robert california becomes a great character to you <laughs> you know what I mean? You yeah, start really true. like loving those episodes. You're like, oh, this wasn't as bad as that's I remember bad. the first time around. <laughs> All right. Do you like telling people you're professional poker players? Uh, well, I like it's interesting because as so when quarantine started, Andrew and I kind of sat down as a family, talked about what we're going to do. And basically I was playing live for a living and live poker went away. And so I had a choice or we both had a choice really, which was to transition to online poker or do something else. And I've been wanting to write a book for years. And if I wasn't going to do it now, then I was never going to do it. So Andrew started playing online and I started writing the book. And so it was the first time where I really didn't have a job title where I was like, well, I can't, I mean, I'm not playing poker. I'm not a professional poker player right now. And maybe, you know, but I'm not an author yet either. And so it's interesting to notice the difference of how I felt when I could say I'm a professional poker player. And and that was my identity. And people, especially because I'm a woman and and maybe it's less obvious or or less like, I don't know, more intriguing to people. 
people always responded in such a, a way that was interested and like that I was cool. So I used to love saying that. And now I'm like sort of swimming in this place where I don't really say that anymore. Um, but it's like, it's an interesting thing to reflect on and not that I'll never play poker again, but currently like, you know, with the baby and stuff, I'm not, I'm not super, I'm not really playing right now. Oh, you will. I'm sure. Yeah, I will again, but (laughs) everyone says that say like, how do, how does the world respond when I say I'm a professional poker player and, um, I know that you had some, you know, for a small portion of time, you're like, I don't really like to say it. Yeah, initially, I, I used to not like to tell people because you get varying responses um, that are can be quite annoying to, to deal with. But then I realized after a few years, like, no, I'm just going to tell people because I don't want to lie, first of all, about who I am and what I do. And the second thing is, like, that's their thing. Like, they can figure out, they can make up whatever they want about it, and that's not going to affect me. So um, once I adopted that mindset, I just, yeah, I just tell people, yeah, I am play poker for a living and, you know, just field the questions as they come. (laughs) Yeah, deal deal with the annoying, oh, so so it's, oh, just gambling degens or how much luck is involved? Or can you turn this $100 into $200 for me? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Uh, Okay. We have a few more here. What was your largest non-poker wager? So it could be prop bet. It could be pit bet. <laughs> so it, it changes like by the day because, <laughs> uh, and it's the same for Christy and I. So we bet one Bitcoin on the Floyd Mayweather fight against uh, <laughs> Conor McGregor. <laughs> uh, so at the time it was like 5K, but it was almost a 60K bet the other day, and now it's around a $35,000 bet. <laughs> Wait, it was way more than 5K. Wasn't I don't it? remember. It was like 8,000 no. maybe. No, it was. Uh, whatever. I don't know what it was. I can't remember. Well, because I remember because because right. you were like, no, babe, this is like a sure thing. Like, <laughs> and I'm like, ah. Uh, Remember how we used to say anybody who said it was a sure thing in Vegas? Well, like, we won uh, the bet, so we did we, okay. we did, but I remember really, really, like, okay. being nervous. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny you brought up Bitcoin because I was just thinking about our friend Ryan Johns the other day uh, who used to work at Card Player and told us all, by the way, during a drinking game about Bitcoin back when it was worth 0.9 cents. No. Wow. He absolutely did, and you can call him. I do not remember that, probably because I was drunk. It was, everyone was very drunk, and I remember just sitting, listening to him on the couch talk about this Japanese guy who created a system for mining, and I was like, but who mines it? It's not real? It's a computer? It it all went over my head, and of course, he bought a billion of them back then, (laughs) and uh, now runs one of the biggest, you know, tech companies in you know, the the country, so. Yeah, he's doing pretty good, I've heard. Talk about hindsight, you know. Yeah. yeah. We should have been listening to Ryan over there. <laughs> yeah, we should have, because all you know what? crazy stuff I mean, he was saying on the couch. All, I think we all knew Ryan Johns was going to be rich, too, someday. We, we yeah. were just too he busy was, drinking. He was destined for, for big things. Yeah. We, he was already rich. Like, I remember asking, like, he was putting half of his paycheck into his 401k. Like, he was one of those guys. <laughs> and I was just like. You have way more discipline than, than Vegas requires. <laughs> yeah, I mean, for like 24, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, that's hilarious. Anyway, a um, few more here. Uh, headphones on at the table, yes or no? Sometimes. No. Sometimes definitely important. Um, yeah, I think for me, it really, like, uh, it helps me. I noticed that, like, I, I have, like, playlists that I listen to when I'm, like, tilted. And so recently I started listening to those playlists while I'm not tilted because I don't want to associate it all the time with, like, feeling bad. But, yeah, I think it's really good for me to to listen to music to help keep me calm for long periods. Uh, so I cycle in and out of that. And this is classical music? Sorry. Uh, mostly, yeah, mostly the classical music comes on when I'm tilted. <laughs> That's why I really try to, like, uh, now when I get massages at the table, which it's been a while since I have, um, I, I listen to classical music when I do, because I'm trying to reprogram my brain. <laughs> and Christy? You said oh, no. I was just, I was just going to say, I, I, it doesn't really help me focus. It, it takes me out of it, so, but every once in a while, I'll just stick them in if, 
I want to pretend I'm listening to music. <laughs> Crap, I just gave away my secret now. Yeah, now someone, I don't know if someone, I have somebody them annoying because, at the table. Yeah, yeah. What about the weirdest place you ever played poker for money? Uh, Maybe a cruise ship. Yeah, that was... I don't know. It's kind of weird. We were like, they went, there were no farm games in Indiana. Oh, oh no. Okay, yeah. So, um, the Navy Club. Oh yeah. Uh, so the Navy Club in my, my my hometown. They basically, if you were in the Navy, you could join this club, and they had these underground like poker games there. And we realized that they couldn't like not let us sign up. So we were like <laughs> eighteen, nineteen years old, and we would come in there with all these Navy vets, and we would just like crush them yeah and they were like all older and like they hated it was like three young people and we were like better than everyone <laughs> yeah. i just picture you and christy like mike mcdermott and worm at the at the union game you just get get exactly. caught cheating yeah, and no, someone beats exactly you in the parking like, lot it's yeah. exactly it's like they're all retired and they have like vietnam hats on and, and stuff. like tattoos of like an anchor on their arm yeah like yeah and you're like you guys are such noobs. You don't even understand what rage I'm playing here. Oh, I know. <laughs> exactly. I know. We were so annoying. Oh, oh my gosh. <laughs> All right. Uh, favorite gambling movie? Okay. I don't want to say the thing that everyone says. So I have to think of something else. Oh, no, Maverick. I just referenced it. <laughs> Maverick is a great choice. He just, yeah. he, I mean, not just. In the last year, had me watch it. And it was. Way better than I thought it was going to be because I don't really like anything old movies, but it was it was pretty good. And for a second, we were like, "Should we name our kid Maverick?" <laughs> it, was only a it was only a second, though. <laughs> My high school mascot was the Mavericks. Oh, it's supposed to mean like like a, a leader, independent. Yeah, not just a horse. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, it's, I, I can't believe you made it so far into your poker career without seeing Maverick. Yeah, I don't know. Well, we righted that wrong not too long yeah, ago. Yeah, and you enjoyed it after, you know, Mel Gibson did all his stuff, you know. <laughs> <That's> a, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah. Do either of you use movie quotes on a regular basis? Uh, there was a period of my life where I only <laughs> spoke in movie quotes. Um, so if you knew me back then, you probably hated me or you really loved movies. Um Slowly over the years, I've gotten that ratio down to, like, mostly <laughs> real-world speak and, like, 5% movie quotes. But, yeah, <laughs> what about you, babe? Did you have a go-to? Um, I mean, I was just a product of the 90s where I was, like, everything was, like, any Jim Carrey movie, um, anything or, like Bad yeah. Boys or, like... Uh, Adam Sandler. <laughs> oh, my God, Adam, Sa Adam Sandler, <laughs> anything, yeah. I haven't seen enough movies to, like, quote them. I'm, like, one where I was like, you haven't seen... Like, Andrew is the reason I've seen The Matrix. He's the reason I've seen... Uh, Back to the Future. Back to the Future. So, I'm not a movie quoter. Even though I did just say, if you're not first or last, it's pretty much the only one because I resonate so hard with that sentiment. <laughs> <laughs> as long as you're not quoting, you know, The Fast and the Furious, saying you'll, you live your life only a quarter mile at a time. Well, we've said that before. Yeah, nothing else matters. <laughs> <laughs> it's all about the family. Um, all right. Do you have a bold prediction for poker's future? I think that... Yeah, I mean, that's interesting. I would just say that I don't think that tournament poker will ever really evolve too much to, like, what we're seeing in cash games. I think it'll, like, for the next 10, 20, 30 years largely remain the same um it'll get a little bit tougher i think uh we'll see some other forms come and go but i think no limit hold'em will continue to be the premier card game i have no idea but that sounds pretty good <laughs> you take my answer yeah christy question for you what was your most embarrassing moment in poker oh Embarrassing moment in poker? Or po in poker media, I should say. Oh, wait, do you, have a time, do you have a time in mind? Because I can't, <laughs> I'm, I can't I'm thinking of one specifically, yeah. Are you talking about Tom Dwan? No, but I want to hear that story, too. Uh, well, well, the Tom Dwan was just the one where I... Uh, 
so he was just about to announce the Tom, the Tom Dwan challenge, this big thing, and everybody was talking about it. And I was given the cover story, so I had to go to PCA to interview him and write the cover story. And it was really exciting because I knew everybody was going to watch this video. And um, Tom was like, oh, I'll only do this interview if you ride on a jet ski with me after. And I was like, yeah, sure. So, <laughs> So we did the interview, and we jump on this jet ski, and he goes out in the ocean, and we're just, like, laughing or whatever. And then we see, like, Phil Galfon, the, the Dang brothers, um, and, like, some other high-stakes players. And, and they're like, you should let her drive. And I was like, yeah, okay, I'll drive. Like, not wanting to, like, be a puss, but, like, also not knowing how to drive a jet ski. I, like, never did before. But everybody's watching, so I, like, don't want to go slow, like, you know, like a little girl or whatever. So <laughs> I, like, really jack it up, and I'm going fast. And <laughs> You're, like, terrifying <laughs> Tom. <laughs> yeah, but, like, I don't know. I'm just, like, going fast. And then all of a sudden, I, like, we're about to hit a wave, and I panic. But I don't – I didn't realize that the brakes are basically when you let go of the gas. So I just let – completely let go to slow down or whatever and tom duan goes flying off the back of the <laughs> jet ski and i see him like hit the water hard and like i'm just thinking to myself oh shit i just killed like the best poker player in the world he's gonna not do the rest of this interview with me this is horrible <laughs> um but i don't know he he ended up laughing and saying it was like fine but that was that's i'm yeah, that's that you were story. Embarrassed at the time. I that's was funny. Embarrassed. That beats my my other moment I was thinking of, which was also at the PCA when you were interviewing uh, the winner of the main event. Poria <laughs> Nazari. <laughs> you remember what I'm talking about? I remember the name now. Okay, so for for the listeners, I got the I got to have the first interview with the winner of the PCA main event, and everybody else is in a semicircle waiting to interview him as well. Everybody's camera's already rolling because they're already getting footage, and I That's stand. That's what makes it tough is the audience you had. <laughs> the whole audience and all of his friends and family are there too, like watching. He's like this big guy, and I I, I go first, and I'm like. Hey guys, welcome to the 2000 whatever PCA. I'm Chris Tarnett here with the winner, and I just totally forgot his name. <laughs> and I just go, wow. <laughs> and then it was so awkward. Everybody was like, and then I had to be like, sorry, what's your name again? <laughs> and okay, come on. His name was Por. I mean, I have it ingrained in my head forever now. Poria Nazari. Like that's Poria a whole name Nazari, to P O O R Y A. How's that? Por- Poria. Poria. <laughs> anyway, he won $3 million that day, so I don't think he really cared. Yeah, I think he was all right. <laughs> he wasn't offended, but uh, it, was a, it was a funny moment for sure. Um, and uh, that wraps up. Oh, what am I doing? I completely forgot about what we do here on this podcast. We end the podcast every time with. The same way, which is a question from the random question generator. So I have no idea what's going to come up, and you guys have to deal with it. Ready? <laughs> Sounds good. Let's tackle it together. All right. What was your worst example of procrastination? Oh, I'll let you take that one. Was it the Tom Brown thing or no? Oh. Or I don't know. Um... Not really, that wasn't my fault. That was oh, his okay. fault. Um, <laughs> I could also change it. We're going to roll again. Roll, roll, it, roll the eight ball one more time. What's your best story from a wedding? Um, oh, this is hard. From a wedding. Um, <laughs> yeah, so a, re- a wedding that rock, I was roll at. Roll again. Re- no, no, it's okay. So a wedding I was at recently... Uh, there was a guy there who was in the uh, in the grooms, one of the groomsmen, and he he ended up hooking up with like four of the girls that was at the wedding, and it ended up being this like really hilarious thing to most of us. But like he was actually like kind of tortured by it because like everywhere he went, he was like kind of <laughs> in trouble with somebody, and it was super. That's fun like to us. straight out of a sitcom. 
Yeah. 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 Like if it's the wedding I'm thinking of, now I've got it narrowed down to a few guys. It might be, but I don't, <laughs> I don't want to say anything. <laughs> anyway, uh, you know, so happy for you guys. Not just, obviously, the shit ton of money and, you know, the tournament success, but the baby as well and everything just, you know, looking amazing for you guys. Me and Paula are super happy. Thank you so much for coming on the show and also for catching up. Thank you so much, Haley. It, it was, was a lot so of fun. Nice. I actually laughed more today than I have in, in, uh, on any of these things that I've done recently, and it's it's been nice. Yeah, it was so nice catching up with you. And I think that, you know, part of what makes this whole thing special, I think somebody was mentioning the other day, it was like this, you know, in, in a way his career is like, led him up to this point and you were there from really the beginning right from the beginning yeah. so i mean when you say 15 years we've only been together for 16 years so like <laughs> you, we've known you forever and um yeah this is really special so thank you well i'm so glad to take full credit for both of your success <laughs> <laughs> and if you guys have any you know parenting questions do not ask me because i'm still figuring it out <laughs> <laughs> That's it. That's the show. You can follow Christy at Christy Arnett on Twitter and at Christy A. Moreno on Instagram. And you can check out her latest content on her YouTube channel. Andrew is on both platforms at Amo Faux Show. That's A-M-O, the number four, S-H-O. You can also check out Andrew on Embrace the Grind, a show that he does with his brother Johnny at etgshow.com Johnny of course is also well known in the poker community as Johnny Vibes and uh, posts his vlogs on his YouTube channel if you're looking for us search for at card player media and don't forget to subscribe if you'd like a free digital subscription to card player magazine then all you have to do is shoot down to the bottom of your podcast app give us a five star rating and leave a nice review Let us know you did so by sending an email to pokerstories at cardplayer.com, and we'll hook you up. Thanks for listening.